Welcome to the Salon. On this episode, the first Orthodox woman rabbi, when modesty becomes a fashion trend, Jewish dating today, women in the Jewish workforce, and an atheist feminist prayer book, it's coming up on the Salon. Hello and welcome. I'm Jane Eisner, editor of The Forward, and you're here at the Salon. And I'm Rachel Sklar. And uh, Jane and I were just kicking off the discussion talking about how the Oscars this year is a veritable Jewish film festival. It is. But have you seen any of the films that are being nominated? I have. Um, I'm a big fan of Inglorious Bastards. Uh, and uh, perhaps that indicates something troubling in my psyche. <laughs> um, wrestling with issues of uh, violence and vengeance. Um, but also it's a fantastic film and an important one. So that's my pick. I saw A Serious Man and I thought it was wildly disturbing, but just hilarious and brilliant. And I, I wonder if people outside um, the Jewish community really get all the jokes, probably not, but boy, did it hit home. And then there was one other film with uh, strong Jewish content, the uh, ed and, and, and Education. And, and education. Did that's you see right. that one? I did not, but I saw that Charlie Rose discussion about it. Oh, well, that's good enough. <laughs> this is how we get our culture <laughs> these right. days, little bits and pieces from other sources. Um, well, we have a lot of wonderful Jewish women here with us today as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest now. Next to me is Ophira Eisenberg. She is a stand-up comedian and writer. And next we have Dara Horn, a novelist, whose most recent book is All Other Nights, a wonderful read. I highly recommend it. And we're also joined by Robin Bodner, who is executive director of JOFA, the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. And they're having a conference very soon in the middle of March in New York. So welcome to you all. You may have read the news that Sarah Hurwitz, who last year was ordained as the first Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, Maharat, uh, a term that was supposed to be sort of like a rabbi, but not really, um, now has been given a new term, uh, Rabbi Avi Weiss, who was the person who taught her and who ordained her, has um, now decided to call her Rabbah, which is awfully close uh, to, uh, to Rabbi. Is this a substantive change or, or a practical one? What do you make of I it? Think it's, I think it's really a combination of both a practical and a substantive. I think this is an evolutionary process. We're moving closer to the real term, the term of Rabbi. When we met, first met with Avi, we were kind of disappointed that he didn't come out with you know, a closer, closer title. And his point was, we need to create these facts on the ground. And why is everybody so hung up on the issue of title? Um, but clearly, uh, there was disappointment. And we're happy to see it moving in this direction. We're not quite there yet. But Rabbah is an improvement. I, I, I keep thinking, you know, when people use the word comedian. That's a very archaic word, but anytime someone calls a female comic a comedian, I cringe. Even though that was, t I mean, that is better than calling them like, hilarity ma'am, or whatever, which <laughs> would be even like, why are you creating a new term for Funny me? Funny girl. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you, you do want to just be like, as a comedian, you just want to be called a comic, or even I think of like, the word actress, other than the Oscars, people don't use that word anymore. They say actor. There's so many of these things that are becoming gender neutral. And when I read Maharat, I was, I, cre I hated that. Well, it doesn't resonate with anything. It doesn't. Anything. Resonate at all. It doesn't. It's, like it's a very, right, right. It's a term. It's, it's not user friendly. People don't understand what it means. You have to explain it. If you have to stop and explain what exactly. a title means, then who am I? What am I? And I think that's one of the actual problems that Sarah encountered when she was officiating in various capacities. It's immediately, she was the other which she right, already was right, the other, but right. the point is to merge. But Dara, you're a writer. Um, words matter. Are, are we being too loose in terms of changing these kinds of meanings? Well, I think that it, what, what matters here is, is the fact that you, you want a, a woman to be in this role of authority, and, but, the, but you don't want to admit it. And I think that the, the discussion behind the title is that uh, is, is really about that substance and it's using language as a screen um, that, you know, th that you want to be able to say, well, we haven't actually ordained a woman as a rabbi, but you actually have ordained a woman as a rabbi. And if you're going to do that, it's, it's dishonest not to admit it. Um, and what it, all it does is it avoids making any kind of commitment to, um, to something that, that you either should be committed to or not. So I do think the, the word does matter. I mean, if someone is a rabbi, they should be a rabbi. And, and that's why, you know, as you said, as Robin said, the practicalities that this woman confronts in, in terms of being mm -hmm. accepted for you know, officiating in various capacities. Outside of the community. It, but you know, we talked matters. about this before. We talked about, like, insert inside terminology. You're in the know, but I'm not in the know, right. and I wouldn't understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So she'll go to a funeral parlor. She'll go to a hospital. People don't know what, you know, I'm a maharat. 
-hmm. But the yeshiva that they formed is still the Maharat Yeshiva. I don't know. I'm right. curious to know whether they're going to change the title of that. I think titles do matter. Oh, really I think do. words are so powerful. I mean, that is basically, I mean, f from the second someone, if I was introduced uh, uh, to a female rabbi and she said, I'm a Maharat, I would... It, You'd say, what? Yeah, it sounds like, like you're... Wife, like I'm yeah, like no, that. it sounds like, yeah, a midwife from the Far East. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and yet we also really have to respect the fact that this is a gigantic step in a particular right. world. Absolutely. True. And I'm torn because I, I agree with everything that you all have said, and yet I also really want to... <coughs> Um, uh, you know, uh, honor the movement that has taken place here in, in just a few short years to give women who are in this, um, you know, much more strict orthodox world, um, uh, you know, acknowledged power. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the question will be whether it goes beyond just this one synagogue, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, you do have some other female leaders, and you have women who are coming up already in different capacities with different titles. This one's an intern. This one's an educator. I mean, you know, different different kind of titles. Dina Nyman Licht is actually what they call Rosh Gila, the head of the congregation at KOE in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others. There are others. But Sarah is she's quite a quite a person. I remember traveling to Maryland with her. And that was a few years ago because she's spoken for, for us many, many times. And the topic was, what comes first, a female rabbi or, you know, or a teacher a head, or a head of a, a congregation? Because actually in many Orthodox congregations, they don't allow, I'm talking about real Orthodox, a female can't be a president. Neither can a convert. And that's another whole story. Right, right. <laughs> right. But, but what's yeah. interesting is that, is that you don't really have... Um, in, in, in each profession where, where you have women starting to enter the profession, that tends to correlate with the profession coming down in prestige. And, and I think that this, what you see is a, a, a lowering of the prestige of the role of a rabbi in some sense. And it's happened already in reform and conservative communities where you know, being a rabbi is not something that a person wants to do because they want to be respected by their peers. And it's sad, but it's true. And if you don't admit it, that's a problem too. Because that's, what's, that's often what's happened in other professions. You see it in, in medicine as more and more women enter medicine is exactly when this becomes a, a profession which is becoming lower pay, which is becoming more demanding, is becoming less prestigious. Um, you see this in a lot of professions. And I wonder if that's something that sort of is also creeping into the rabbinate as something about the way that we as American Jews look at the rabbinate and how we don't really see this as a career that, that is to be aspired to by the best of the best, which is very sad. I think so, too. I, I, I was unaware of this sort of idea. I mean, I get it on a philosophical sense that of the diminishing of the, I, of the value of the job as women uh, raise up. That, that's what you were just saying. Yes, and right? I don't know whether, it correlate, whether, it, whether it's correlation or causation or which one comes first, but I think that there's, there's something unspoken that's happening there in, 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 sure. in, 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 in many fields where, where women have, have, become, have entered. And then certainly in, in the rabbinate and in, in the reform community, the, it's, almost, it's become predominantly right. women. You and know, what, in, what in you the, read is also as women it. become more involved, so the men are backing off. Well, yes. and it's interesting that yes. you say that because one of the other topics I was hoping we could discuss today was women in the workforce. Uh, you know, there's been a new study da done by the Pew Research Center that has found that women are becoming the primary breadwinners in American families. Um, I'd like to think this is because we're so wonderful at what we do, but it's also that sadly because <laughs> because so many men have been laid off from mm -hmm. their jobs. But and also because women are more educated, women are also graduating at the same rates from colleges and universities, mm -hmm. and it's a modern world now. It may be, but yet we at The Forward did a big survey a few months ago looking at the 75 largest communal organizations in the Jewish world and found that very, very few of them are run by women. So even though there are more women in the workforce, there aren't women still in leadership it's, positions. It's still an old boys club. And what do you think that is? Well, shall we read from the Torah for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the question is, can women read from the Torah? Can women? That's a, that's a whole issue. That's another whole that's thing. That's a whole thing. But, but seriously, you have this situation where certainly in the Jewish communal world, three quarters of some of these organizations are staffed by women. And mm. yet, there's still never been a woman fully appointed to head a major federation. How can Actually, we I think there is one. There's one in an acting position, but right. not, but not um, a full appointment. Is she a rabbi? Or a no. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I just think it, it's slow progress. I mean, the the difference between someone 
in the workforce and a role of leadership is obviously the perception of of that is totally different. I mean, I can I can walk in anywhere and be part of the team, but as soon as I'm leading it, oh, scary. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I, I especially I you know you probably have more to say about this than I do in Jewish organizations. It's it's got to be the slowest process of every little bit that a woman can get is like a huge deal because there's you no know, there's this this tension so much between the evolutionary and the revolutionary and I really think that this is a very slow process incremental steps small yeah. steps you'd like to believe that by now yeah exactly we're, we're supposed there. To be, everything's supposed to be speeding up at the age of the internet I think it's actually the opposite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's the, the, the crisis in the Jewish communal world, though, I think is exactly the opposite, though. I don't think the problem is that women aren't in positions of leadership in this sort of thing or that they're be pay and paid less or all these kinds of problems. I think the bigger problem is with Jewish men. And that you are having men, yeah. Jewish men, Sister. no, right. Jewish, Jewish men, no, Jewish men drop. No, this is a crisis. The Jewish men are dropping out of communal Jewish life, um, and it's certainly absolutely happening in reform and conservative, uh, in the reform and conservative movement, where you have fewer and fewer men uh, applying rabbinical schools and this sort of thing in leadership positions. But it's not just that; it's also in, in terms of involvement in congregations, involvement in Jewish organizations, um, and I don't even mean in terms of leadership. I mean just in terms of membership. Um, and then it's it's even starting to be more of a problem in the Orthodox world as well. When you look at something like um, you know, as they, it's called the shidduch crisis, um, as basically women become more and more qualified and more and more able to do things on their own and less and less dependent on men. You have men who are essentially dropping out of, of communal life. And are, are and there has to be, the problem is suddenly that once you open the doors to women participating fully, the men feel like that there isn't really a place for them anymore because they, in some sense, are, are not needed in that role. And, and suddenly- Don't and, say that too well, loud because the rabbis are- <laughs> <laughs> well, but I do think it's true, and, and what's interesting is that historically this goes back to a, a model of Ashkenazi life, um, which you know, in my other in my other life, I'm a scholar of Yiddish literature, and so I know a little bit about this. And in, in Ashkenazi traditional Ashkenazi culture, women were the ones working, and men were the ones ho uh, studying Torah, men, and women basically had the responsibility. Now we always talk about should women be at home versus should they be working. Well, in the past, women were working and and raising the children, while men were studying Torah and not involved really in either working or uh, raising. Children. See, my mom worked, and, yeah, and so did you know. mine, um, and all, of, and and many of us did. But but my my point is more that you know women were really doing, it, but but that was because working in the perfect working in any kind of business was considered a lower class thing to do than studying Torah. Studying Torah was the most valued thing, and now even in the religious community, studying Torah is not considered the. It's sort of you know you're if you're the one who's sort of at a kolel, that's not considered a status thing right. anymore, except I, perhaps I, in a black hat community. I was going to say, in a black hat I think. If you, if you go modern to modern orthodoxy, modern, modern orthodoxy is one thing, but if you go to a yeshivish community, yes. or oh, a yeshivish black hat, community, of course, is still, I mean, it's still I in still that world. I still live in Brooklyn. Yes. And, no, that's, I'm no, no you're, you. absolutely right. no, you're absolutely I, right. About I, that. I just but like to ask uh, you about this because the last time I went to an orthodox synagogue, which was last week, there were a whole lot of men there. Yeah. Very few women, and the men were doing everything. So I, I haven't seen well, a women diminution. Women are exactly welcome there to do things. No, and and I understand that in a different way, but I didn't see a diminution of of men's roles. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in our synagogue either, and and ours is modern Orthodox, sort of leaning a little bit, as many others are to the right. But the men are there, and that's because in our shul, the women really are not participants. Uh, we don't have a we don't have a very high mechitza. You can he see, you can hear, right. but the women are not called up. The women don't participate in laning on simchat Torah. The women are not giving given a Torah, so you know they tend to come in. Some of them will come in during the laning. They can come in the beginning of musaf. They come when they come. You mean during different parts of the service, right? But if there's right. but if there's any any community where you do start to allow women participation, that is when you start to see the men dropping out. And I think when you Not see these in independent in Israel, which is fabulous. I was just there three weeks ago, and I actually I felt the opposite. I thought this was <laughs> a community. I thought this was a community where you suddenly see more and more women participating, and then fewer and fewer men participating. I saw it as much more even. I have to tell you. Well, I, I would like to think that that's true. I hope uh, that's true. I've only maybe maybe it's once. changed since last year. I, don't I was know. there a year. Ago. I don't know. And but, I love uh, this service. We're too there. capable. We have to stop being so capable. Well, bread makers, bread winners. Like if we just go, all right, we're not doing as much. Maybe things That's would true. Be. Maybe laziness should be our new rule. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we're on the topic of the roles of Jewish women, there's a, another question that's come up that's a, an appearance question is, what is the role of modesty now that women are participating at every level of society? Should we be worried about covering our knees? Clearly, I'm 
not. Um, <laughs> but how we appear in public is there, you know, is there a, this modesty movement? Is it relevant to us? Is it is it relevant to you, Afiras? As since we're both Sorry. wearing very similar um, tops. <laughs> well, <laughs> a throw to you. I will say I will say um, that I'm very conscious of what I wear when I'm on stage in terms of establishing authority, because I don't. I mean whatever, some women establish authority by dressing less modest, but I will go for something a little bit more modest because I don't want to, because uh, I'm speaking and I don't want people to be thinking about different things while I'm on stage trying to get a group of men and women who in a comedy club may have been drinking to agree that I'm the only person in control. And I totally think about what I'm wearing That's in terms of that, yeah. So when you say you think about it though, what does that lead you to wear? I'll wear something that's a, I, I will not, I rarely wear dresses or skirts or anything kind of sexy on stage. Maybe a, a well-fitting top, but I won't go uh, for. A dress and a skirt is I'm not, sexy. I'm not Rita Rudner. I would like to be Rita Rudner and wear a ball gown, but uh, I'm not doing that. But I, I will be a little more conscious about, I guess I'll dress a little bit more masculine, perhaps. Huh. And does not it make a provocative? difference? Not provocative. Not provocative. Yeah. But there's a, a sliding scale of what's provocative as well. Yeah. I mean, I people have different views. That's just my opinion. Like, I want to feel basically like I'm wearing the pants. Seriously. <laughs> literally. <laughs> that's literally like what the I want to The notion of feel wearing like. the pants yeah. is that's it's amazing that it returns to that. And yet, when Hillary Clinton was known for her pantsuits, she was criticized for not being feminine enough. It's I like, know. how can you win? It's, you cannot win because you're put in a, I mean, I work in comedy, male dominated, obviously, much like billiards, my last career. No, but uh, <laughs> it's always the same. But you know, you really do. You're in a constant battle of establishing yourself as the power, voice of power. Uh, when I was a young reporter, I, I always had to dress nicely because otherwise nobody would take me seriously. It's amazing, you know, right? It, it, it is. Although now that I'm older, I'm sort of glad I look young. But <laughs> <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> but and yet, you know, I honestly, I mean, sometimes I I see people the way they're dressed, even in public places, in a restaurant or on the subway, or you know, frankly, even sometimes some of the young women in our office, and I kind of want to pull them aside and say. Um, don't you think you should wear a little bit more? That's a lot of thigh, lady. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, and it's not my role to do that. I mean, I'll tell my own daughters mm -hmm. uh, that I think <laughs> they um, perhaps address the size of a manila envelope might not be the right thing to wear. Um, <laughs> Does that come up by you going, are you going out like that? <laughs> Well, when they were at home, yeah, it came up occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there really are, are, you know, very different mores now, I think, out there. And I understand the way some, some parents especially feel about their daughters, that they don't want that uh, to be the way they're presenting themselves to the world. I will say that as a, as a woman with sort of a, a more classic Jewish figure, you know, it's more curvaceous. I'm, I, there are clothes that I can't wear. There are clothes that other women can wear. I can't wear because I am I am conscious of how the shape appears or if too much shape appears. I mean, you do have to be aware of that if you want to be taken seriously. But at the same time, I don't feel like I need to downplay anything that I may or may not have. Um, I, it's a it's a line to walk. I mean, there's I should be free to be whoever I want to be and be various versions of that as well. You know, I'm I'm in a professional setting right now. I'm wearing a professional outfit, but like I do have a life and you know I live on the Lower East Side and so in the summertime when I go out it's like tank top and mini skirt that's comfortable that's casual yep. you mm -hmm. know it's certainly not overly modest though I guess <laughs> see is, we all agree all right. yeah. <laughs> we're like well, interesting it's a very big well, issue though in orthodox day schools for yeah. girls it really is like where are their role models? The, well, first of all, they see what's happening in the culture outside, and the parents and the and the, you know, the, the administration, yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, are trying to rein them in. But this whole issue of objectification and you know, who am I and what am I, and and what do I mean and what's my worth, what's my self worth, and it, it really impacts issues of self esteem. We're reading more and more about anorexia and bulimia in some of these schools. They've brought in programs mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. And it's always modesty with regard to the girls, right. not the boys. Well, they don't have a whole lot of choice in their outfits, it seems. <laughs> but you can, you can go to a beach, too. but wait a minute. But you could go to a beach, and the guys can wear shorts, okay. and not necessarily even a t-shirt, and the women are all covered up. Right. Mm -hmm. So. 
And not only not that, quite. but modesty is also not just about what you wear. For, it shouldn't it's about be. about how you comport yourself. It's about the way you but, speak. But it's very often, that is the way today people are defining it. And that is the way that solely. the students, that is correct, and that is the way the students are interpreting it and perceiving it, because that is the way it's put forward to them. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and just talk about how that um, evolves in terms of dating and um, those kinds of relationships. You know, the Jewish Channel is running this uh, new show called Sugim. It's gotten a lot of attention. It's from Israel, and it's about the Orthodox Jewish dating scene. And I'm just sort of wondering, what is the dating scene like now? Can anybody tell us? I mean, Ophira, you've been married just a couple years? Yes. Maybe you can remember what it was like before then? <laughs> oh, let's see. Rolling back in time, back when we picked up big phones with dials. Um, t I feel like in New York is a, its own little microcosm of a Jewish dating scene. And uh, for the most part, I didn't have a lot of luck. I was on J-Date, but I, I didn't have a lot of luck just meeting Jewish guys at large, I, a lot of Jewish guys. That was a requirement? You know what, it, it was not for me. It's not, it, my, my mother would be happy either way. A lot of Jewish guys I met, it was a requirement, very specifically, which I was surprised, frankly. Well, a requirement that they wanted to marry a Jewish Yes, woman. that they would maybe date girls mm -hmm. of other faiths and religion along the way, but when it came right down to it, yeah. which I was surprised. I was raised fairly, uh, uh, you know, without I think it's because my oldest brother, you know, he basically broke the mold by not marrying someone who was Christian. So after that, it was like the rest of them. They're like, oh, do whatever you want. <laughs> we already lost it on the first kid. But, uh, yeah, I was so surprised. And a lot of the women that I met, too, were just transfixed with this idea of dating someone Jewish, which, you know, I don't fault them. But at the same time, I'm like, how about someone you just like? I mean, that's hard enough. What about someone that you can, you know, have anything in common with? So I just found that it was weird. I couldn't meet any Jewish men except for on J-Date. When I did meet them, they were all about, well, I you want to marry. You were Jews in comedy? What? I know. I know. We're, it's, they're all agents and managers. <laughs> <laughs> but do but we do enough to really help people in their 20s and 30s and even 40s find mates and find yeah. happiness if that's what we believe as a culture? Well, the problem is that there isn't a model. Um, anymore for because so many people from our I mean I'm 32 I imagine a couple of us in, are, are in this generation and uh, you know there isn't a model for you know that, that of when people should get married in some sense there is in the orthodox world and that's of course creating its own kind of crisis um, and in the non-orthodox world there's a sense that you know you should go and do your career and do what you know go to medical school and do what you need to do um, and then you have a lot of people who turn around when they're 30 and think, oh, my God, you know, this is something I should have been thinking about for the past 10 years, and I haven't mm -hmm. been, mm -hmm. men and women. Um, I found that I, I got married fairly young for this world. I got married at 23. What? Um, I got in, Yes, I got engaged on my 22nd birthday. You? Everyone thought I was insane <laughs> because I, and every, you know, people actually would say things to me like, oh, I didn't know you were orthodox. I'm, well, I'm not. Um, and, and it was I, 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 at, I got when I got married at 23. None of my friends at my wedding had ever been to a wedding before. Wow. Except maybe a, a relatives. I threw the bouquet. Everyone jumped out of the way. <laughs> I had to throw this bouquet ten times, and then the band leader picked it up. It was. Uh, I mean, it, and it really is true. But and then what happens though is that everything for these for these people is happening sort of ten years later than it traditionally did. Um, I waited a long time to have children because I felt like such a freak show being married at 23 in this world. And I waited. I had my first child. I was born. When I was 28. And I remember going to a new mothers event at the at the JCC and walking in and seeing everyone there was 10 plus years older than me with a first child. This is so interesting. I and never hear this perspective. Yeah, I only really hear the, the other first one. Of time. Being uh, like, the and people I that I'm 45 yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm the last of my high school friends. Like I spent my 20s going to weddings and jumping for the bouquet, not because I was dying to get married, but because, come on, that is just fun. I'm a little competitive. But there's, I, I think I the problem, the problem is, that there, is that the popular culture gives you this idea of what, of, of what marriage is supposed to be, that it is supposed to be this one true love and there's this one person out there for you. A lot of people would be fine. You know, and, and it's it's about making life work. And I mean, I'm very much in love with the person I married, and he's very much in love with me, and we have a terrific relationship. Um, but, you know, I, I, I didn't sort of come to it, I think, with this idea that this was sort of, you know, that I was looking for the one. You know, I mean, and, and maybe that's because I happened to meet this person when I was young enough that it, there wasn't this panic mode, because I met him when I was 19. Um, but I think that that's, that that's the problem, is that there's this sort of expectation of, uh, of 
you know, of perfection right. in, in a relationship. And, and, and not settling. Yeah, and God forbid I, I, this idea. Settle. I mean, the I, truth is settle, because settling is fabulous. I have to say that. You just can't see it as Maybe you don't have to define it as settling. Right, what you, think oh, is se what you think is settling means contentment. You yeah. know what, I think they should take away on all these dating profiles or anything where they write your hobbies, what you like. No, no, no. Write your worst qualities. Yes. Because oh, the excellent. person that can put up with your crap <laughs> is the person you should be with. That's what it all comes well, down to. Well, I'll admit that one of my you know, uh, extreme pleasures is reading the wedding announcements in the New York Times, and I'm always <laughs> struck by um, there'll be some you know, story about how they met 15 years prior yes. and or did all these different things, and now they finally realize it's true love. And, and I'm really happy, of course. I'm always happy for everybody. It's sad, um, too. But it's also exactly because I feel like there are all this, all this time that you had to build a life but together. But if they, if they had start, gotten together at that first point, then they'd always maybe have the what if or second guess themselves. You know it's no, not necessarily no. true, but no. I really feel that I am I, I'm the oldest in this group. I'm <laughs> from another generation. I, I got married at 19. Good surgery. <laughs> Excuse me? I have very good plastic surgery. <laughs> She's actually and 115. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my hat's off to you. Um, so it, this is very interesting, but I see it's like my with my granddaughter, who's 23 now, and what's happening. And you know, we're talking about a modern Orthodox community. Um, the the more right wing is still getting married very very young, and she has a real issue. She is modern Orthodox, mm -hmm. and um, she said, you know, Bubby. She calls me Bubby. When I come back to my community, I don't quite fit in. I don't dress the way they do. I don't really, I, she feels that, that these kids who are getting married so young haven't really found themselves. They don't know who they are. And frankly, she thinks it's ridiculous. So then you begin to worry, okay, what's gonna happen with her? Is she gonna be one of those that then waits and waits and waits? And looking for you know for something. Why is it one or happens? the other? I mean, I think that yeah. there's a healthy continuum. Right. Exactly. I think because I think for her, it's not so easy to find a community. Right. right. And I think that's yeah. really the issue. Well, and I think that's true for a lot of it these people. It does take a village. <laughs> I mean, it really no, does. No, no. I, does. I think it does. It's very important. I mean, speaking as the 37-year-old single woman with no prospects on the panel, and I, I mean, I say that sort of as a joke, but I, I don't worry that much about that. I mean, I. I I do occasionally see some of those those meant to scare me articles about how my eggs are in trouble. Like, you know what? My eggs are probably fine. Everything's probably fine. And I will be happy when I am in a relationship that is the right relationship. I've I've had options and I've been someone's wrong option before too. Like there's people I would have married. Yeah. But um, yeah. you know, I'm I'm not that fussed about it. And in the meantime, frankly, I'm I'm sort of done with wasting my time on filler guys. Mm -hmm. Had a, a couple of those in there. <laughs> um, that's a nice name for them. Yeah, that's you know what, there's a I've better, there's good. a much better <laughs> term out there. So yeah. I think that's a good Interim chance for, for us to uh, to move on to another topic. It's it's interesting as singles are, are, are changing the face of the Jewish community, there's also uh, you know a lot of movement afoot where traditional Jewish prayer and prayer books are, um, are being reimagined there's uh, one that just came out written by an atheist feminist, uh, another written by um, uh, another Jewish woman who actually just uh, won a big book award. Do, do we need this? Do we need a separate prayer book? What do you think about that, Robin? I don't really think so. I think there's something very beautiful when you travel around the world as a Jew to be able to go into different services and you feel at home, you feel amongst your people. That's not to say that there aren't issues with the different Sidurim, the different prayer books. Um, the beauty of Aliza Lavie's book, and we actually co-sponsored that that's conference. That's the second book that's been uh, that I mentioned. Right, by Aliza right. Um, we we co-sponsored that. Um, it was a conference on women in prayer, and unlike the men, we women got together. The different denominations, and there was something very special in it. And I. I attended one of the sessions, the Theology of Personal Prayer, really spoke to me, but not just to me. There were women in that room who were actually crying because the fact that, and I think that you know, the prayers that we read in terms of prayer books are very different from being able to create and write a personal prayer, something that really speaks to you. And I think there's a difference between public and private. Um, well, prayer is personal. 
Right. And I think the, the experience of wanting to open yourself to prayer is personal. That's why I'm all for this. Even for the, the Open Sudur project, where you can, it's like a wiki commons where you can go and customize mm -hmm. your own uh, Sidur. You know, if people are going to sources and, and seeking out sources for prayer that fulfill them and, and engage them, then I do not see a downside. I still see a, a thread of commonality between them, that is Judaism. But, um, you know, if that's what it takes to engage people, let's keep them coming. Traditionally, there was a, a Jewish women's prayers in, in, were in Yiddish, and there, there were always Jewish women's prayer books and Jewish women's Bibles, which were really more like Midrashim, or <laughs> interpretations of biblical stories. So this is actually sort of a very old tradition right. of having women's prayers be separate from men's prayers and having men and women's religious experiences be really different and separate. But we lost that, I think, and that's what Eliza brought back with her book. Right, and the fact that it exists shows that people want this. Like that's why I like that, you know, all these open projects too, because people want it. They're mm -hmm. looking for mm -hmm. it, so they're mm -hmm. creating what they need. But I think there's a big difference between the actual words, some of which I may not really believe in my gut, and the ceremony of, of the prayer, of the davening, mm. um, which I think is very, very important. And I think that is what's missing in many, many synagogues today. Amen. Well, uh, on that note, I'm afraid our wonderful conversation on the Salon has to come to a close. I want to again thank our guests, Ophira, Dara, and Robin, and of course my wonderful co-host, Rachel Sklar. Uh, for everyone here, I'm Jane Eisner, editor of The Forward and Forward.com. We hope you'll join us again. 